There are millions and millions of people that want to stay truly independent. They want to be free. They want, they want to pick and choose what jobs they're offered to do or not to do and call their shots. That's the independence that I have. This is Sergio Avedian. He's a former Wall Street trader who now drives for services like Uber and Lyft. But Sergio is more than just an Uber driver. He's one of the leading advocates for rideshare drivers in the United States. Sergio Avedian. Sergio Avedian. Sergio Avedian. It is great to have you back with us. It's been way too long. Sergio is the senior contributor at a website and podcast called The Rideshare Guy. He's made it his mission to help gig workers, particularly at Uber and Lyft, understand the ins and outs of their industry. They'll send me screenshots about their fares or what's happening. Are they lower? Are they higher? Do they like what's going on? Actually, I've become almost like Uber and Lyft support for them. And if I can help them, I'm going to help them. But if Sergio is a gig worker, what does that mean? What is a gig worker? Gig workers don't work at traditional jobs where they earn regular paychecks and benefits. Instead, they work directly with hundreds, sometimes thousands of customers each year. As a gig worker, Sergio represents one of the fastest growing labor demographics in the United States, and an increasingly controversial one at that. But the concept of gig workers is nothing new, even if many aspects about the regulatory discussion surrounding them are. Hundreds of years ago, everybody was an independent worker making shoes, making dresses. Um, the people who weren't independent were those who basically worked as servants in large households. They had an employer. Um, most other people didn't. This is Tammy McCutcheon, one of the country's leading authorities on wage and employment laws. She says that the division between independent workers and corporate employees is baked into the DNA of the Industrial Revolution itself. During the Industrial Revolution, Instead of having somebody who makes all parts of a shoe, you start having factories. And the craft people basically disappeared and were drawn into these factories, which at the time were considered abusive. But we've come full circle now, and the question is still there. What is better, to work independently as an independent craftsperson, or is it better to be an employee and work in a nine to five job in an office or in a factory? And so hundreds of years later, we're still debating the issue. Cynthia Esland, an NYU law school professor and leading scholar of labor and employment law, says that Americans fully embraced the corporate model until the latter half of the 20th century, when social attitudes about labor began to shift dramatically. Back in the 50s, the big firms in the economy had what were called internal labor markets. They would employ everybody from the CEO at the top down to the janitors in the mailroom. People tended to stay with one company for much of their career, and this vertical integration had the tendency to raise the wages and benefits above what those same people would make if they just quit and took their chances on the outside labor market. But starting in the 70s, 80s, we've got a combination of deregulation, globalization, more pressure, and financialization. These big companies started outsourcing. So instead of a vertically integrated company, you had a proliferation of these contracting out practices. And that includes everything from outsourcing to China to now uh, independent contractors. The move away from corporate employees has alarmed some labor advocates who see it as a threat to the legal protections that the American labor movement fought for for over half a century. Advocates of the change, on the other hand, point out that many workers want the freedom to choose their own hours, lifestyle, and pricing, and contend that allowing them to do so is a vital facet of the free market economy. Either way, the trend has sparked a fierce regulatory debate that according to Rebecca Rainey, senior Labor Department reporter at Bloomberg Law, has only intensified in our current political climate. Members of the labor movement unions have argued that businesses have been using the independent contractor model to exploit workers. However, businesses and Republicans view this as a legal way to give workers some flexibility to set their own hours. It also, given the nature of a lot of these jobs, 
those are harder to regulate. So the question of who is an employee or who is an independent contractor is definitely one of the most contentious issues we're seeing in the labor law field. People have so many questions about where the line is. Even though independent contracting isn't new, the contours of our current gig economy are notably different today than in times past. The internet, especially through apps that connect workers with their customers, has changed the game significantly and in ways that lawmakers are struggling to keep up with. Look, gig economy is new. It's only 10 years old, 12 years old if you look at it. Uber first showed up 12 years ago. But the gig economy is not just for Uber, Lyft drivers, DoorDash drivers. There is close to um, 660 professions that are considered freelancers, such as filmmakers and even doctors and some accountants, and they're true independent contractors. Some people like the flexibility and the freedom it gives them and then make some extra cash to support their W-2 incomes. But the other people completely depend on this, on what they do as, as self-employed small business owners and independent contractors. And that's the problem that I see with all this regulation that's coming down. It's going to cover everybody, put everybody under a net that some people are completely opposed to. In the United States, the Fair Labor Standards Act outlines a set of rights for workers who are classified as employees. The Fair Labor Standards Act is a law that sets minimum wage requirements, overtime requirements um, for, for workers who are, you know, working more than 40 hours a week. However, that law only applies specifically to employees. So if you're an independent contractor, you are not protected under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Under the Trump administration, the Department of Labor issued something called the Independent Contractor Rule as an attempt to create a federal standard to determine which type of workers qualify as employees and which qualify as contractors. The Trump administration issued a rule that made it much easier for businesses to classify their workers as these independent contractors who don't have the protections under the law. They tried to simplify. They said that we're gonna look at two core factors. Who controls the work? and whether the independent worker has an opportunity for profit or loss. And they did this because people need to know the difference and they need to know what the standards are, what the law is, so that they can make a rational choice for them, for their life, for their life circumstances. It sort of gave employers a clearer target for how to ensure that your workers will be treated as independent contractors. Problem is, of course, that's a choice that has uh, often huge costs for workers. Under the Biden administration, the Department of Labor has proposed to withdraw the independent contractor rule, saying that it made it far too easy for employers to abuse workers by classifying them as contractors. The Biden administration is in the process of issuing a new rulemaking that is very much expected to make it easier for workers to be classified as employees under the law. But if there are substantive changes to the Fair Labor Standards Act that lawmakers would like to see solidified in law, it is up to Congress to rewrite that law. There's a great romance in America with the idea of independent business people, small business people, and that's great for those people who actually have that autonomy and the bargaining power. But what you don't want to allow is for employers to figure out a strategy for treating some of their lowest paid workers as independent contractors and escape all of those minimum standards laws, all of those employee rights that the labor movement and worker advocates have struggled for years to get for employees. My problem is it's very arbitrary. You can't predict the result because whether it's a small business who wants to hire um, independent workers so that they can fulfill a business need, or whether it's an independent worker who wants to figure out whether or not they're being treated as they should be treated under the law, we all need to know what the answer is. We need predictability. And for me, it's all about choice. There are studies out there that the independent workforce today is between 60 and 65 million people. So we have to maintain the ability for workers to make their own choices, employment or independent contracting. The most gig workers do not want to be employees. They like the independence that comes with this flexibility, the freedom that comes with this gig work. 
But unfortunately, most gig workers do not go in depth. The average duration of a driver or a gig worker on any platform is less than a year. Up to 80% quit in less than a year. What one side of the argument is coming up with saying that, yeah, you're abusing these drivers. They don't have any rights. They don't have any employment rights. They don't have health care. They don't have anything else. Well, as an independent contractor, if you run it as a business, then you will be able to make enough money to put money aside for a new car, for health care, for these, for, for these benefits. Unfortunately, it's becoming a lot tougher to run this as a business because the orders that I receive, most of them are not profitable enough for me to run this as a profitable entity. And, and most drivers are in the same situation as I am, and they need more protection. I was in a big meeting, and it was a bunch of people in the gig economy and tech people, and it was talking about this new way of organizing work. And they talked about how you know flexibility is key to our uh, business model, and, and we have workers who just really want to work more than 10 hours. It would be uh, bad to constrain them. And what I said is, you know, this is exactly what the apparel companies would say about their, their way of outsourcing uh, work to child laborers and families. And it's our business model. Uh, we'll go out of business if we are forced to actually comply with the uh, labor laws. And our answer at the time was tough luck. If the only way your business model works is by exploiting people and treating them at a level that falls below what society has decided as a minimum standard, then goodbye, go away, good riddance. Most independent workers, they want to be independent. One study that I looked at, only 10% of the respondents wanted a full-time job who were doing gig work. And for me, one of the great things about, the, about independent work is the barriers to entry are so low. With marketplace apps like Uber, like Instacart, like Uplift, like Handy, you don't need to hardly invest anything yourself. You don't have the security of those employment laws, but you also work when you want, how you want, for whom you want. For a lot of people, employment is the better choice. But there's also millions of people who have made the independent choice. And I think it's really important for those, that choice to be there for everybody. Instead of waiting for a top-down federal solution, many states have taken the initiative to create their own plan to provide contractors with protections and better define the relationship between employers and their employees. California Assembly Bill 5, for example, which was designed to regulate companies that hire independent contractors, extends employee classification and certain benefits to a larger selection of workers. In California, we saw this large fight that would have provided workers with some benefits, um, you know, per mile rates or even some guaranteed pay or workers' compensation, but it still doesn't quite provide a path to unionization, and of course, it doesn't classify them as an employee under the law. We've also seen these gig companies go to other states like Washington State, also in Massachusetts, um, to try and establish you know, a similar model where it's, we're giving you some benefits, but you're not going to have employee status where you get all of the benefits. AB5 has denied hundreds of thousands of gig workers in California the right to make their own choices. What is usually cited as a reason to want to restrict independent contracting is the alleged exploitation of independent workers. And that is, they've been making that argument for a decade. When I say that argument, I'm like, okay. So we're saying that 65 million people don't understand the difference between being an employee and being a contractor. But also these companies have to make a profit. If they don't make a profit, they will not have any employees, right? So when you give these types of benefits to contingent workers, it sounds really good. I'm gonna get 1.5 times the minimum wage. I'm gonna get sick pay. But who's paying for that? There's only a couple ways companies can pay for it. They can increase their prices or exercise more control over where we work so that they make sure that our hours are very productive hours. 
there are people out there advocating this type of change, but we don't have enough experience at, at, uh, to know exactly what's going to happen. Every state that has its own employment laws will have their own body of law defining uh, who's an employee, who's covered. Yes, that is hugely confusing and it's a problem for companies that operate across many jurisdictions. The question is, you know, there's no perfect world here. It's, is that a bigger problem than the, a, a single test that enabled employers to more or less decide whether to treat their workers as independent contractors or employees, you can't really leave that to entrepreneurial discretion. Too much is at stake. As for Sergio, he favors a hybrid solution like ESHB 2076 in Washington state, which provides rideshare drivers with more robust protections, including minimum per trip payments, paid sick leave, and workers' compensation benefits without forcing the state to reclassify millions of people as employees. The most important thing is to have uh, individual states and legislatures get involved and pass laws like um, they have done in Washington state. I think that's an amazing model to follow, and, and it's been working, and it seems like a win-win-win situation. So for a permanent change at the federal level, it's going to take Congress to rewrite the Fair Labor Standards Act. Given how Congress is divided right now, party-wise, that's probably not going to happen. There have been attempts, there have been bills to, you know, address this issue that haven't been able to get to the president's desk. So it makes sense that these companies instead are going state by state to get this quasi status for, for their workers. My two cents is, if you're going to write laws that apply to millions and millions of people, you should experience this yourself first. Get some of these drivers on your panels. Interview these drivers. Interview local drivers in your area. If you're a DC politician, put them to testify. I'm willing to do it. Talk about the real issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the stuff they're coming up with has no consequence over my life. So all the politicians in the federal level, what they should do is they should really talk to real people who are doing this actual work. It's a little hard to envision a best case scenario, but I think it does involve higher rates of unionization, which may require laws that make it easier for people to form unions better regulations that are more fully enforced, and public investment in education and training. I think when working people realize that they have a lot to gain by joining together and overcoming their divisions, those workers' jobs will very likely be made better. We have to have all sorts of forms of employment and independent work so people can make their own choices and live their lives like they want to live them. And I think the pandemic really brought that home to all of us. That you know what, maybe working nine to five in an office inside a big city is not making me happy. I want an option. On the other hand, having to get up in the morning and spend an hour on a, on a gig app to figure out you know, how you can make enough money to live that week, that's not a great choice for everybody either. So let's keep the choice alive. So what course should the government take? Given the ever-changing landscape for American workers, any federal solution will be complex and difficult to navigate. Experts like Sergio, as well as Rebecca, Tammy, and Cynthia will be crucial in helping Congress understand this issue so they can better fulfill their role of representing the will of the people.